Okay, wow. We're living in some exciting times, eh? Some good times. Wonderful times. Our ultimate goal is not so that we can, you know, have this perfect personal life that nothing ever goes wrong, uh, you know, that we just feel wonderful all the time, which is good, and our circumstances are just perfect, that there's, you know, just plain sailing and that kind of thing. You know, circumstances are very unpredictable because we're living in a fallen world, but we're not of this world. And we belong to the kingdom of God, right? And uh, if you live your life around how good your circumstances are and how perfect everything is around you, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Because we don't live according to how wonderful our circumstances are. That's not our goal, is to get perfect circumstances. But our goal is to live for the Lord and to live in His kingdom dimension, if you heard that this morning, and to live out of that. And then God's kingdom comes into our lives and begins to infiltrate every area. And then if a circumstance arises, we have the equipment to overcome and to, and to get healed and delivered and help is on the way. But we live for the Lord and we represent the Lord and we represent His kingdom. I think you all know this. But anyway, I just want to do, in, in the short while that I've got, I want to just, just tell you something, that the world has entered into a time of shaking. A time of shaking. And it's a wonderful time for some and a terrifying time for others. The church... The born-again children of God belong to the kingdom of God. We've been taken and translated out from under the domain or dominion of darkness. And we've been brought into the kingdom of God, of which Jesus is King of kings, Lord of lords, unshakable, everlasting, glorious Lord. He's the king of the kingdom. He established his kingdom and he's promoting his kingdom and he's releasing his kingdom through His Spirit, in the church, and through the church. We are founded on the rock. He said, the gates of hell. He said, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And we are part of His church. He's gathering His people. And we will never be shaken, because we're part of His kingdom. But God is coming, and He's shaking the kingdoms, that fall under the realm of darkness, even though they don't even know it. Every agenda in the world that is not part of God's agenda, God's kingdom agenda, is being shaken at this time. And there's times of shaking. There's smaller shakings and bigger shakings. But God is shaking everything that does not belong to His kingdom. He's getting the attention of the world. I promise you, it may look like the devil is in the saddle, but I want to tell you this. God is on the throne. God is moving. God is working. Now, in the book of Haggai, I seem to be drawn back to the book of Haggai. All the time I go back to the book of Haggai in the Old Testament. And in Haggai chapter 2 and verse 6 to verse 9, it reads this. For thus says the Lord of hosts, listen very carefully. Thus says the Lord of hosts. Once more, right? Once more. And then in brackets it says, it is a little while. Once more, it's a little while. I will shake heaven and earth. Hmm? I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and the dry land. And then he says, and I will shake all nations. He didn't say, I'll shake some nations. I will shake all nations. Look at this. I will shake all nations and they shall come to the desire of all nations. So what is a shaking? A shaking is for the purpose that they will come. Ever thought about it? So he's shaking nations. It's not all destructive, by the way. It's not all destruct, you know, destructive. You're going to hear in a moment. He's shaking all nations. And then it says, 
and they shall come to the desire of all nations. Okay? He says, they shall come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory. He's stringing all the thoughts together. He's not just saying, hey, I'm going to shake and destroy. When he's talking about shaking, he's saying, and they shall come to the desire of all nations. Who is the desire of all nations? Christ himself. In this time of shaking, we're going to start to see the greatest end time harvest that we've been prophesying and talking about for a long, long time. And it has begun, believe me. There is a move of God worldwide, I promise you. Maybe not on the scale that we desire yet, but it has begun. And people are starting to come into the kingdom. People are starting to come because God is shaking systems. God loves people, but He shakes systems that control them. Systems and belief systems they believe in. He's shaking it. If there's been a time of shaking in your life and you've been shaken by something that has happened, God is drawing you to himself and he's going to give you answers. So it says, look at this, and it says, and I will fill this temple with glory. I know it's an Old Testament context, but in a New Testament idea, the temple is us. So when they're shaking, they're going to come. And as they come, the glory of God is going to fill His people. We are the temple, the people of God. So shaking is connected with people coming to Him. And it's also connected with revealing glory. And filling His people, His temple, with glory. It's a good word. Come on, man. This is a good word. It's good news for us. So when I say God is shaking things and shaking systems and shaking heavenly things and things are being shaken, glory is coming. All right, so he says, and I'll fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Look at verse 8. Then he says, totally different thought, the silver is mine. The gold is mine. The silver is, gold, uh, is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give shalom, the word peace. It's not just peace. It's nothing missing, nothing broken, wholeness, wellness, health. You know what I'm saying? Everything about what God's kingdom is. He's going to, he says, and I will fill this place, this place, and, I, and, and, and in this place, I will give shalom, says the Lord of hosts. So the shaking is not such a bad, you know, a bad thing for us. There's glory involved, you know. There's nations coming. There's, there's shalom that God is releasing into his church, into his people. And as people come, this shalom will rest upon us and manifest in our lives because he is all about peace. He's the, he's the prince of peace. Are you with me? So he says he will shake. He will shake. Now, let's just have a look at a couple of ideas about shaking. Ezekiel the prophet has, has an experience, not just a vision. He has an experience. The hand of the Lord comes upon him. Ezekiel 37. We won't go and read it, but I'll just tell you about it. It says, The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and took me and put me down in the midst of a valley. And behold, it was full of bones. And indeed, the, the bones were very dry, he says. He says that he sees this valley full of bones. Bones. Speaks of death. Speaks of death. Something was alive that died, and now all that remains is bones. Just a remnant of what was alive and powerful at one time. Wherever there's bones in your life, something was alive, something was working, something was flowing, and the enemy was able 
to kill that thing in your life, your vision, your dream, your desire, whatever God told you. God's in the business of resurrection power. And during the time of shaking, God is locating the bones in people's lives, the bones of things he promised that he brought to life, but the enemy was able to rob people. But look at this. So Ezekiel sees and surveys this whole valley. It's full of bones. And then the Lord says to him, Son of man, can these bones live? Can this situation change? Can I transform this? Is this situation beyond my ability, basically? <laughs> Ezekiel answers the Lord and says, Oh Lord God, only you know. Hmm? And then God says to him, Prophesy to these bones, son of man. Hey? It was like God was saying, I need your involvement. I want to do something, but I need you in agreement with me. Let's do something. But you open your mouth. You, you, you prophesy. And so the Lord actually says, prophesy this. Oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, I will cause breath to enter into you. That word breath means spirit, the spirit of God entering in. And he prophesies, and he says, I will do this and I'll do that. If you go and read it later on, Ezekiel 37. And so Ezekiel says, so I prophesied as I was commanded. And then it says, suddenly there was a rattling. There was a noise and a shaking and a rattling. That word that, uh, that says rattling is also the word shaking. So wherever there's shaking, it means the power of God is at work to bring life out of death. So, say, so shaking's not all about killing something. It's about bringing life out of something that, that, had, that had died. So in this season and time of shaking, God is coming into areas of your life where the enemy succeeded in robbing you and killing off something in your life and making you confused and whatever else, and maybe even mourning over something you lost. And he's bringing life out of death. And there was a shaking and a rattling, and it says the bones came together, bone against bone. He saw the sinews covering and connecting and the skin coming over. There was a process of restoration and resurrection power. And for the church and for anybody who calls on the name of the Lord and reaches out to God, this life is going to come, and a, and a noise is going to happen. And things are going to start coming together. And I prophesy to you, some of you have really been struggling. And God is saying, I'm starting to shake those areas where there are dry bones in your life. And, I'm, and I need your cooperation to begin to speak life into your situation. And start to speak the resurrection life of God into your life. You need to cooperate with God. He's not going to do it for you. All of it for you. He needs your cooperation. He'll do it if you do your bit. Shaking is going to bring life into areas. And restoration. I prophesied. Many of you are going to experience restoration. And things coming together. Now, another thing. An example of shaking. I'm just unpacking a few things for you. In Acts chapter 12, we, we read a story of Peter, who's arrested by Herod and taken and thrown in a prison. James, the other apostle, the brother of John, was, was arrested and executed with a sword by Herod himself. And because every, you know, everyone, all the religious people were very happy about it, he decided, let's arrest Peter also, and let's do the same thing. And Peter's put in prison. And then the church is praying, seeking the Lord, all night prayer meeting. And in the middle of the night sometime, an angel comes into the cell where Peter's lying. And shakes him awake, knocks him and shakes him awake. Peter wakes up and the angel delivers him out of that jail. So shaking is to wake people up. Because God has a plan, and it's not over when God says it's over, or un until God says it's over. So Peter was shaken awake, 
Elijah, in his time of being vulnerable and sitting under a broom tree in the Old Testament, in, in, in um, 1 Kings, somewhere around chapter 19 or so, Elijah's down in the dumps. He's had a real season of incredible things, but he's, but, but he's vulnerable at this time. And he's under a broom tree wanting to die. God sends an angel, and the angel shook him and woke him up. And God is doing this. God's going to do something really supernatural to wake you up out of what the enemies try to shut you down and keep you in. People have been woken up unto what God wants to do, really. Are you guys with me so far? Wonderful. Very good. Let's have a look. There's a couple of other things. Another thing that I see is, is uh, way back in the Old Testament, the children of Israel are under Egyptian slavery for over 400 years. And it's time for God to deliver them. So obviously he raises up Moses and Aaron. And he sends Moses with a message. I think we all know it. Let my people go. So Pharaoh says, no way. Who is God that I should listen to him? So God said, okay, I'm going to show you who I am. And so God begins to plague them with ten plagues. And ten plagues come upon Egypt, one after another. And Pharaoh is absolutely, after everyone hardens his heart, God shook that country. He shook every single thing about that country, economic system of that country. He shook their, their, their belief systems in their gods. He shook just about every system that Egypt had. He shook it to pieces. He shook it and shook it and shook it so that Pharaoh would let go of his people. So when God shakes systems, he's saying, let go of my people. Let go of my inheritance. And God is shaking systems so that it will begin to let people go. And God delivered his people by shaking that nation to pieces. And even after the firstborn all died in Egypt and they were let go, Pharaoh thought, okay, let's give it one more try. Let's pursue them. Let's get them back. Let's bring them under slavery. And God said, come get it, buddy. Come get it. Bring your whole army and watch what I will do. And man, they went into the middle of the sea. You know the rest of the story. God shook them. So when God shakes systems, he's saying to them, let my people go. Hmm? Maybe you're caught in debt. You're caught in a situation you don't know how to get let go of. There's good news for you. If you will allow God to do it, he'll give you a solution. You'll begin to shake that system. He'll show you what to do, that it will be able to, You'll be able to be free, and God will set you free. He wants to do it. Some people are caught in, some, in, in, in such bondage, in such things that the devil's got his hooks in. And that system doesn't want to let you go. And God wants to set people free. Now, I'm not saying you're going to be set free of debt in one moment. But what I'm saying is, as he shakes that system, he'll give you solutions. He'll show you what to do. He'll deliver you. Okay, wonderful. That's another example of God shaking systems and a nation for a purpose. Wonderful. The Bible says in Psalm 29, it says that the Lord shakes the wilderness. He shakes the wilderness and then he also causes the deer to give birth. A wilderness is a situation people might find themselves in. Not God's wilderness, but a wilderness of confusion, bad decisions, uh, things that happened that people hold on to, offenses, and something that the, enemy, that the enemy could use to dry everything up in people's lives. When God takes you into a season of a wilderness, it's a preparation for more, and it's always a very short season. And it's never a wilderness of your own doing. Jesus was taken into the wilderness to, for a showdown with the devil, to conquer the devil. 40 days and 40 nights, not 40 years, by the way. And he conquered the enemy. And often in the wilderness, it's a preparation time 
for what you're about to step into. It's a time to conquer something as well. And it's a time to learn how to lean on God. The wilderness is a place, God's wilderness is a place of learning to lean. To learn to lean. It says, I think in Song of Solomon, who is this? Coming up out of the wilderness, leaning on the arm of the, of the beloved. So wilderness is a place of learning to lean on God. Not a wilderness of your, or your, your own doing or something that happened in your life that drove you out into the wilderness and you're in this terrible wilderness, you can't get out. There, there, there seems to be something you know, that's always dragging you down and you can't put your finger on it. Don't say you're in God's wilderness because that's not God's wilderness. That's another kind of wilderness. You know, over the years we've, we've met people and we say, hey, how, how are you doing? And we can see oppression on them. We can see the, you know, the robbery and thievery of the devil in their lives. But then they say, oh, I'm just in God's wilderness. Sorry, you don't know God. You don't know God. I mean, he'll take you in there to prepare you. Elijah went into a short season of a wilderness at the brook Cherith, and God sustained him, raised him up, gave him a word, commissioned him, prepared him. It's a place of preparation, a short, short season of preparation. And, and then God released him into a great assignment. And so don't look at your bad situation and say, this is God's wilderness, but you've got no answers. There's no, you know, uh, a revelation. There's no breakthrough. It's just one crisis after the, the, the next and the next. That is not God's wilderness. That's a wilderness of the enemy's design to shut you down. Like Elijah ran into the wilderness, it wasn't God's time, but he found himself there and God delivered him. God sent an angel. He was down in the dumps and depressed. That's not God's wilderness, to be down in the dumps, depressed, and talking rubbish. Like Elijah said, oh God, you know, I'm no better than my fathers. Uh, let me die, you know. No, buddy, I've got another assignment for you, but, but I've got to shift you. Okay, you got it. All right, let's have a look. Just a few more things, and I'm almost done. All right. Paul and Silas, you know this story. Paul and Silas have been doing the will of God, and, and uh, Paul casts a, a, a demon of divination out of a slave girl, and uh, the guys who owned the slave girl got mad about it and uh, decided to do something about it and had Paul and, and, and Silas thrown into a dungeon. For doing something good. Hmm? And so they end up in this dungeon. Feet are fastened in the stocks. You know the story. And uh, instead of being down in the dumps and depressed and moaning, complaining, they decide they're going to pray and they're going to sing. So they pray and they sing to the Lord around about midnight. Shaking. An earthquake came and shook. The foundations of the prison were shaken. All the doors opened and the chains were loosed. Not on just Paul and Silas. Everybody's chains were loosed. All the doors were opened. Sometimes God will allow you to get into a dungeon so he can loose other people's chains. Doesn't sound quite conventional, but it's God. So yeah, they're in the dungeon and everyone's, everyone else's chains are loosed. And the jailer comes and falls on his knees asking what he must do. And he gets saved, his whole household. Amazing things. God shakes things for a purpose. Eh? Aren't you happy that God is for you? He's never against you. God is good. Now listen. There's one of the things Kathy and I have learned. You've got to know that God is good, not just in your head. Oh, well, I agree that God is good. You've got to have an experience that God is good. The Bible says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Tasting something is an experience. Hmm? If, say, for instance, some new fruit was discovered, and I was able to bring it from somewhere, and I stood here in front of you and said, have you guys ever seen this fruit? And it's the weirdest looking fruit, but the most fantastic taste. And you all said, no, we've never seen this ever. First time we've ever seen it. And I started munching it. 
and I was describing how wonderful this is. I can describe how wonderful it is. I can show you what it looks like. I can even let you smell it. You'll get a whiff. But, but if you don't taste it for yourself, you'll never experience what I'm experiencing. And so the goodness of God has to be experienced. You have to experience His goodness. And when you begin to experience His goodness, and it, and it says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. When you taste an aspect of goodness, it's not just one bite. Once you've tasted, you're going to want to have more and more. So you need to taste, have an experience of the goodness of God. And God is reaching out and God is wanting to do something that you experience His goodness. That you will have such an experience of God's goodness that if something happens in your life or around your life that affects you, that is an opportunity perhaps to make you feel bitter towards God, angry with God, upset with God, in a controversy with God, and you'll go back to your reference point of the experience you had with God. And you'll say, God is good no matter what is going on, no matter what has happened, and He is going to give me an answer. If you are convinced because you had an experience of the goodness of God, and something comes your way to rob you and to make you angry and upset, go back to that reference point. God will answer you. Do you know why God... God wants to release answers to people, but they never go back to their reference point where God was good to them. When God did something that you knew beyond the shadow of a doubt, this was God. He did this for me. I know it was God. I had an experience with God, and I know this experience wasn't bad. This was revealing the goodness of God to me. I, I promise you, if you keep that experience, the remembrance of that experience or experiences of God's goodness, He either healed you, He answered a prayer, He delivered you from an impossible situation, He did something, maybe it was a little thing for, for you, it was a little taste, and then the next time He answered your prayer was another taste, and then He healed you, it was another taste, or then He did something else, or He averted a, a, a disaster. And you knew it was God. Something. You know. Many of you know this. I promise you, just about, ev well, I think everybody in this place has experienced the goodness of God at one time or another. Where you could have died and, and, and something bad could have happened to you, but God spared your life. God helped you. God healed you. God touched you. Something He did for you. And if He did it for you, He was reaching out to reveal His goodness to, to you. How on earth can you believe now, at this point, if another situation arose that you could not work out in your head, why did this happen to me, or why did this happen to Joe Soap, or why did it happen to a family member? Now, how on earth can you get in, in a controversy with God? If you know that you tasted goodness way back here, how can you say, now God is being bad to me? And that blockage will block you from answers in your life to that situation that you're questioning God about. So instead of doing that, go to God and say, God, I know you're good. I can't work this out. I don't know. But I'm asking you, based on my experience of your goodness, that you're out of your goodness, you're going to give me an answer because you're my dad. You're my father. I just feel chains falling off some people. I just feel God is saying, I'm going to show up with something goodness. You're going to taste me again. Some of you, you're going to taste him again today. Some in the next few days. I can sense the goodness of God is coming your way. Not because you deserved it, but because God wanted you to taste again. It's one thing to say, believe in God. But, you know, oh well, why must I believe in him? He comes and he does something that is so incredibly good when we never deserved it. Because he wants us to taste him. It's the time to taste it's a season to taste. The church is going to taste him again and again and again. You know, it's good to remember that first taste. But I want to taste again. I want to taste another part of God. I want to see something else. Oh, taste and then you see. 
You don't just taste and you remember. You taste and see. Taste is an experience. Seeing is a perception. What do you perceive? Once you've tasted, then you can see. The reason why you can't see is you haven't tasted or you forgot what you tasted. Hmm? Come on now. Isn't that right? That's what God wants to do. We're in this time when systems are being shaken, people are tasting. The church is starting to taste again. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm prophesying this. You're going to taste again. It's time to say, God, I need to taste again. I'm challenged. I'm battling. I'm struggling. I need to taste again. God says, I'm, I'm going to give you another taste, a big, fat taste. I'm telling you, a taste. Just very quickly, if you're in that place, boy, I tell you, I've been there a few times. Kathy as well, a few times. Where we've needed, you know, you get in this thing, you say, God, I don't understand what the heck's going on here. What is going on? Then we go back to that reference point. Oh, God, yes, we tasted. We tasted something. But Lord, give it again. And then he does something incredible. And then we see the hand of his goodness. Wow. God is good all the time. But you mustn't just say it from your head. Now some of you, maybe, you've forgotten that taste you had of God's goodness. Or maybe there's an overwhelming situation that you're struggling with in your life. Where you know you're really battling. And perhaps you're really not sure if you really tasted the goodness of God. I want you just to stand up in your seat. I'm going to pray for you so that you encounter that taste again, another taste. Come on now. Get up. Stand up in your seat. Just stand in your seat. You're saying, God, and when you taste, you're going to begin to see. Answers are going to begin to come because you'll once again believe the goodness of God. Once again, you'll begin to say, I believe you for your, because you're good. I believe God wants to do it for you. He wants to do it. I don't know why I said this. I wasn't planning to say this this morning. But I feel just to end with this. Thank you, Father. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. You know, it says the goodness of God leads a man to repentance and a woman and a boy or a girl. God doesn't get on your case to lead you to, repent, to repentance, beat you up, give you a whipping, break your arm and your leg and give you cancer. No, 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 no. God does something incredibly good in an undeserving individual so that he can lead them to repentance. Isn't that amazing? Every, uh, you can, I mean, I've, I've met people, just eyes closed, I've met people who are so angry with God, in such a controversy with God, so angry and so hard and so, you know, they don't want to be there, but they can't help themselves. And God just comes and does something incredible personal for them and they taste again and this goodness overwhelms them now i'm going to release this to you and i and i thank you i know god wants this for you this is one of the major things kathy and i are living and camping at right now is the goodness of god it connected us with destiny to believe in the goodness of god when you believe the goodness of God because you've tasted, you step into the realm of the miraculous and the supernatural of God begins to ooze out everywhere. That's the key to the miraculous and miracles and signs and wonders and healings and stuff going on in your life and breakthrough. And that promotion that you were waiting for but that didn't come and bang, it starts to happen. All right, Father, today, in the name of your precious son, Jesus, Father, if we want to find out who you are, we look at Jesus. Exact representation of the Father. Father, you are good. Jesus, you are good. Holy Spirit, our comforter, our friend, our coach, our guide, our intercessor, the one who lives with us, puts up with everything in our lives. You love us. God, you are good. Lord, I ask you for experiences that they will experience and taste and see that you are good. Father, I ask you, Begin to meet with them with something. Do something for every single individual in this building this morning to connect with an experience. Lord, I'm asking you for an encounter and an experience for each person. Personally, 
that they will experience goodness, your goodness. Lord, a big, fat taste, a huge taste that, Lord, they'll never, ever forget. And more after that. Lord, let them experience more goodness, more deliverance, more healing, and answers to the questions that they're struggling with and battling with. I ask it, Lord, in Jesus' name. And I release it right now. Just receive it. Say, God, I open myself up to your goodness. Just say, God, Lord, I open myself up. Come on, you say it with, with conviction. Let's say it like, like we in the army together. Lord, I open myself up to your goodness. I want to taste. I need to taste. I'm struggling, Lord. I want to taste you again. In Jesus' name, amen.